few more things that the machine makes a little bit later on. Um, now, but the key point, as I mentioned, is that the machine is capable of printing out a significant fraction of its own parts, which means that any one of you, ladies and gentlemen, who've got one can print out another one for a friend. And because it's free under the GPL, you don't have to pay any license fees, of course. Um, you just uh, give it to your friend, and then your friend has the ability to print out all those objects that we saw on the previous slide and lots of other things beside. Uh, this is actually the very first time that the machine copied itself. Uh, that's me on the left with a slightly projecting stomach um, and the balding head. And the chap on the right with the ponytail is Vic Oliver, who's another one of the guys on the core team of the project uh, from New Zealand. His was one of the lollipops on New Zealand that you saw on the map earlier. Um, the machine on the left is the first machine that we made. And you'll see it looks like Eric's machines over there. That's version one of the Rep Rap machine. Uh, that machine, of course, there was no Rep Rap machine to make its parts. So we made the parts for that on a commercial 3D printer. Um, and then that machine on the left made the parts for the machine on the right. Uh, and that machine on the right was assembled, and it made, that's the parent machine on the left, the child machine on the right. The machine on the right made its first grandchild part uh, on the 29th of May, 2008. And in fact, the first part that the machine on the right made was a part for itself. And the reason was this. Uh, you'll notice that there's this chain that runs around here that drives the vertical movement of the three coordinate directions. Um, when we put the thing together, we discovered we'd made that chain a little bit too long, so it was too slack. And so the machine didn't work properly because the vertical movement wasn't being driven properly. However, we could make it work properly simply by holding a screwdriver against it to give it a bit of tension. So what we did was we designed a little cable tensioner, which is over here. Um, and uh, we then had the machine make that while we held the screwdriver onto it so that it could make it. And then we fitted it to the machine, and then the machine worked. So not only can it copy itself, it can also implicitly, when you've got a machine that copies itself, it can repair itself. So all this is really like MP3 music sharing, but for real solid stuff. Here's another thing from Thingiverse. That's a pan and tilt camera mount, webcam mount, uh, made in the machine. And though at the moment the machine only works in plastics, uh, we're, we're moving towards having it work with lots of other materials and improving the precision. Again, I'll say a little bit more about this later on. Um, ultimately, there's no reason why it shouldn't make any stuff. It'll be a long time before people use it to make super tankers for shipping all around the world. Uh, it'll be rather less time before people are using it to make the equivalent of an iPod. OK. Now, this is the point where I just start pontificating and waving my arms about. Um, and so if you feel like disagreeing with anything I say, please heckle. It makes things so much more interesting. Uh, this is, I contend, how the world works. Um, there are basically four levels of activity in the world, four levels of constraints on what people do. And these levels, as you go up higher and higher from one to four, uh, each level trumps the level below. Each level completely dominates the level below. Um, at the bottom level, there are rules, things like you must not eat pork, or here you must not drive faster than 50 kilometers an hour. Um, and those rules are essentially things written down on pieces of paper by a human being or a group of human beings in the hope, sometimes backed up by main force, that other human beings will do what those rules say. And, of course, society extracts sanctions for people who break the rules. Uh, if you rob a bank, you go to jail for 10 years. If you marry someone outside your religion, you get executed. Um, it's um, the type of punishment you get sometimes fits the crime, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but we've got that entire system. And that system runs at all sorts of different levels. If you're a member of a sports club and you cheat at the sport, you've certainly not committed a crime, but it may well be that the opprobrium which falls upon your head as a consequence of the disapproval of all your friends is far worse than going to jail. And that's the way that human society works at that level. Above the level of the rules is the level of money. Um, and almost always, money will trump the rules or make the rules change in order to fit the money. Um, as an example, uh, in 
almost everywhere on Earth, uh, it's against the rules uh, to ingest the alkaloids made by the poppy. Uh, on the other hand, it, one of the most successful businesses in the world is supplying those alkaloids at enormous profit. Um, and that business goes on almost entirely unimpeded by the system of rules, which lies underneath it and is less powerful than it. Above the level of the economics and uh, money is biology. Um, an example here of how biology trumps economics, uh, imagine a 17-year-old buying some training shoes. That 17-year-old will spend 200 euros on those training shoes, whereas he or she could equally easily buy a pair for 40 euros that would be functionally just as good why, according to the rules of classical economics, has that person broken those rules of classical economics? Why have they spent more money on something than they need to? The answer is because they're not buying training shoes, they're buying themselves a peacock's tail. Uh, in other words, they're performing a biological function rather than an economic function. And of course, above biology is physics. Um, physics is the substrate on which all of this operates Nowhere in biology is there a perpetual motion machine. Uh, it has never evolved, and the reason that it has never evolved is because physics makes it impossible. The second law of thermodynamics, which is about the most solid physical law that we know about, says that you can't make a perpetual motion machine. So evolution has never hit upon a way of doing that. Of course, the fact that evolution hasn't hit upon something doesn't mean that it is, is impossible. Uh, but in this particular case, that is impossible. Okay, now what I want to do is to look at rep rap, how RepRap works in the context of the first three. Uh, I'm not going to say very much about physics. There's a great deal of physics in RepRap from the non-Newtonian nature of the fluids, as the plastic becomes as it melts and so on, um, the way in which the electronics works, all of that. But I'm not going to be talking about that today. There's an enormous amount of detail about that stuff on the project website. Any of you who are interested can go and look up the physics and the engineering of RepRap. I'm going to look at the first three today. Let's start with the rules. Um, and as far as a home three-dimensional printer is concerned, the system of rules that we have to be co consider uh, are what are called registered and unregistered rights, things like trademarks uh, and what's called passing off, uh, things like copyright, uh, which is an unregistered right, patent, and registered and unregistered design. Um, I should make the conventional caveat here of I am not a lawyer. However, a lot of what I'm going to tell you about uh, is actually research done by a lawyer, a guy called Simon Bradshaw. And he and I have written a paper on the legal aspects of RepRap and similar machines, which we hope is going to appear in the Edinburgh Law Review. Um, the law here that I'm talking about is the law in the United Kingdom, uh, which is almost identical to the rest of European law. Uh, there's a great deal of commonality across the whole of the European Union on how these laws work, but it is different in the United States, and that's an important point. And where I, I know about differences, I'll mention them, but I may not mention every last one. Um, and let's look at these in detail. Oh, incidentally, as I go along, I should say, um, on the right or in the bottom of my slides from now on, uh, there'll just be little examples of things made in rat rat machines, um, which I may or may not comment on as we go through. But if you get bored with what I'm saying, you can at least look at the little object on the bottom right. Um, and that, as you can see, is a little miniature television for an iPod um, cabinet, television cabinet. Yes. OK. Um, trademarks. Well, you all know what trademarks are. They're things like Exxon or the shape of a oh, Coca-Cola or whatever written in that curly script. Um, passing off is the offense in law of uh, selling a fake Rolex watch. It's, uh, uh, it's making it appear that something is manufactured by a famous company when in fact it's not. Um, now, this is fairly straightforward. Um, if you wrap, wrap something including a trademark or if you try to pass it off as a product that was made by a famous company, then you are a bad person according to the law. The law is completely straightforward on this. Um, if you fake a trademark or if you fake a product, then that's against the law, and that's it. Um, and and uh, uh, there's really not any great dispute about that. Um, however, there's not a great deal of incentive to do those things. Um, it always seems to me that this, though, though imitation, as the cliche goes, is the sincerest form of flattery, um, we as a community should all have the courage of our convictions, and when we make something, say that we 